Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the Sales Leaders Playbook. Today we welcome to the Soap Studio, Keith Butler, CRO at Observe Inc., a Mike Spicer and Sutter Hill Venture backed company. We discover why he has been chosen to pilot the next snowflake. This is his playbook. series for 33 CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. Welcome to another episode of Hunters and Unicorns. I'm Simon Kutis and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Hey, everyone. And we're absolutely delighted to welcome Keith Butler. Keith, welcome. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the show, Keith. So, Keith, um, CRO at uh, Observe Inc., Sutter Hill backed, um, you know, VC backed startup, many say has the potential to become the next snowflake and congratulations uh -huh. obviously uh, a recent announcement of a uh, series a round 35 million yeah thank you very much yeah we don't set big goals here you know be, to be the next <laughs> biggest company ever and in, in software sure yeah uh, but it's also kind of a recent appointment of yourself you've only been there since uh since april is that is that right yeah, I did. I, I joined, uh, actually, I think I joined in, in, in March, but yeah, just, just fairly recently, maybe six, seven months. Great. Okay. So just tell us a little bit about uh, Observe. We, we're going to obviously talk a little bit more about it kind of uh, later on in the show, but just kind of frame, uh, you know, what is it about? Just tell us kind of the, the higher level. Yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, about, about Snowflake and, uh, and observe it really it's 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 not only built on top of it uh it's 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 our data it's our data store but also um you know the model that 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 was born um with chris dagnan and and mike spicer and the whole team at uh at snowflake around around sales um is is, is happening here and uh, and that's really one of the reasons why i came was you know um sutter hill finds really tough technical problems to solve they solve them and they layer on sales on top of it and, uh, and, uh, and, and amazing things happen, obviously, as, as you can tell from, from the history. So uh, I was really excited. It's kind of where I've been digging around the last couple of years since I, uh, since I left Perfect. I was trying to, trying to kind of learn something different, get in a little earlier and, uh, and help companies find product market fit. So um, when Mike and, and Chad called, it was, uh, it, was, it was an easy one for me. Yeah, great. We're going to talk a lot um, about you know, your, your journey at the moment, because you are building something, you know, pretty remarkable. I know it's still early days, but you've got great plans and, you know, really looking forward to discussing some of the strategy, some of the playbooks, some of the vision, the mission. We will go through that in a bit more detail, but just want to start by going right to the beginning. Um, you know, just tell us, how did you get into software sales? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'd say, you know, into sales in general by mistake, Really, I was uh, I was an athlete in college, and I graduated. And um, I, I remember I had kind of two offers. One was um, to be a claims rep at a uh, at a big insurance company in downtown Toronto, and um, the next was whatever all of my uh, all of my friends were doing, which was going to Xerox. All all my my colleagues in sports were going to Xerox to learn how to learn how to sell copiers. And so uh, I thought that sounded like a heck of a lot more fun than. Um, than sitting and doing claims. 
So I, uh, I just went and tried that, not thinking I would be good at it, just give it a shot. And um, PTC, they did a lot of recruiting. So we um, did a lot of recruiting out of, out of Xerox because Xerox in the, in the day was, um, was a really good uh, place to learn how to sell. And so they, they was a good recruiting ground for PTC. And um, I fended them off for a while and then eventually, uh, and then eventually joined, uh, joined the Canadian team up in, uh, in Toronto at, at PTC. And that's really where I got into software. But it was, I figured, you know, I was getting pretty good at it, but, um, I, you know, I, everyone in software was making so much money back then. Uh, I figured I could probably get a better return on what I was doing uh, if I could figure out how to, uh, how to sell software. Fantastic. So you were five years at Xerox, 1995 up until 2000. And then yeah. 2001 was the, was the start of PTC. Um, we've heard some really interesting interview stories. I don't know if you've got any that you want to share or if you can remember the day that you were hired and who it was that hired you and if there was any funny stories around it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, how I was hired, I, um, they told me I need to fly out to Minneapolis and meet, uh, meet a guy named Scott Rudy in the airport. Um, I thought it was fancy just getting on a plane back then. I was like, okay, well, that, that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> I went and, uh, went and landed in Minneapolis, met Scott Rudy for about 30 minutes in the airport and, and flew home. Um, uh, that was the start. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then we get into the, then we get into all the, all the good stuff doing pitches and, uh, and digging in, staring at somebody in silence and trying to sell them a pen and all this, all this stuff. Uh, it was a wild place, but, um, I loved it there. I thrived there and, um, you know, I learned a ton. It was amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. We've heard stories of people having their CVs ripped up. We've heard stories of, um, being told and asked why they were even in the same room as the person. And obviously it's, it's all a technique to catch, you know, and to start to really get to understand someone's character, which is just a, a really interesting start. And so Xerox to, to PTC, you know, it, it is documented that it's a, it's a really tough place. You know, how did you respond to the environment? You know, what, you know, how, was it a big steep learning curve for you or? Uh, well, the environment, no. I mean, I, you know, I, I think, you know, Xerox was not an easy place to, to work either. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why PTC liked it. You'd basically get a, a zip code and, um, and, you know, and a bunch of brochures and kind of set you out and you kind of got to, had to go figure it out. Um, we were on draw, so we didn't even make salary. So you, you kind of, you eat what you kill. And, um, and so if you can survive there for a bunch of years, you know, PTC figured, you know, you, you could, you could take the next step and just, you know, learn how to sell more complex things. But, you know, the core, the core characteristics were often there and the Xerox guys often did really well at, at PTC. Um, I, I don't know. I think I thrived in that, uh, in that environment. It was clear, crystal clear. The expectations were clear. Uh, winning and losing was clear and, uh, and you had to be, you had to be tough and, um, you know, I, I kind of liked, I kind of liked those things. So I, uh, I, I think I fit in, I fit in fine. Obviously, you know, it, it is well, well documented. It was a really tough place, but at the same time, there was a clear strategy which required the resilience. You know, there was obviously the framework, there was method to the madness. I think that's a, yeah. kind of a subtle way of putting it. How important was that foundation for you to get you where you are today yeah well um massively i think um in 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 a number of ways i think um you know one thing that ptc did was was you know put things like medic in place to allow us to, to allow us to to do to do things now you know when i was in a, a fairly young seller in my career i didn't really understand why those things were happening you know why i needed to why I needed to get metrics to, to associate with my, with my identified pain, for example. Um, and so, you know, you did them because you were told to do them and because, you know, that's, that's what, what you did. And then you learned later on in, in, in your career there, at least I did, why we did those things. Um, so, you know, I'll give you an example. I was, um, I was selling to a company in Montreal and um, the pitch we were given sounded good, but I couldn't get it to stick. It just couldn't get it to stick in the executive. And um, 
finally, I met a, a guy in there who, who explained to me, you know, what they were trying to do financially at the company. And, um, and it, uh, it, it really impacted me. I'm like, yeah, I'm not making those connections between, you know, my product and what we can do and how we can help their product development life cycle go faster and, and, and their economic and their economic goals. In fact, there was a massive match there, but we couldn't, we weren't making those connections. So, uh, me and this champion basically built this connection and, and took it to finance. And all of a sudden I had a sales campaign and I, then, you know, I realized that's medic. Like that's, that's, that's the value, right? That, that's what they're teaching us to do. And kind of, it was a big, it was a big moment. I went and did a big deal there and uh, had, had a lot of success there, but that was kind of a big moment for me in my career. So you asked me, does it have an impact? Yeah. It kind of comes in layers. Um, but, um, but that's, it's foundational. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's really interesting because, um, I, I suppose one of the things that we've heard from some of the other guests is that that success starts to become infectious and you almost start to become addicted to that success. Is, did you kind of start to feel that perpetual kind of, the engine, the fire kind of really start going, was it PTC or, or was it kind of a bit later on that it really started to sink in for you? I, I like I say, it come, it came in layers for me, but I know another big moment where this really solidified was I was at Blade Logic, and, um, and, um, I, I, I had the opportunity to travel with a guy named Marty Cardi, who, um, who was an amazing sales guy, but you know, um, I realized really quickly that he was doing something that I, that I wasn't doing. I mean, half the stuff he talked about, I didn't even understand uh, what he, what he was saying to the customer. Um, I mean, and he was talking about their process, the customer's processes and, um, and how, and how blade logic could transform what they do and finding real deep pain in, inside of, inside their operation and then relating, relating blade, blade logic to it. So, um, like those, I remember coming back from that trip and said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing this wrong. I thought it was good. And now I realize there's a whole different level here. Um, so, you know, those, those, and, and, but it's all, it's all in medic. It's all in the foundation. You just got to learn to connect the dots. And that's what, you know, that's what great leaders uh, do. And the ones that I had the opportunity to work with, who you're talking to a lot of them, um, I did for me. So, so I know we're obviously kind of transitioning across to, to blade logic and we're kind of you know, somewhere, somewhere between that, you know, in, in this discussion, but once you started to identify those gaps in yourself, Keith, how did you react to that? And, and, and how did you remedy that gap? Um, well, yeah, once you identify it, it's kind of like turning the lights on in a dark room. You see things that, that no one else can see, or you feel like no one else can see, or at least a lot of people can't see. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's half the, that's half the battle. I mean, you gotta be open to learn things all the time, even though you think you're pretty good. I mean, I thought I was good coming out of Xerox and then I thought I was good at PTC and then I thought I was good at play logic. And all of a sudden, every time I'm like, uh, learning more and, 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 and so on. So I think you got to be open to that. That's, that's part of the deal. Um, and that happens has happened. It continues to happen to me now. Um, and then you just got to dig in, you got to get into the details and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, make those things strengths. And I think you do those things one at a time and all of a sudden you got a, you got a skill set that, that you can help others and teach others to do. And, and that's kind of the path I took. Sure. So you did almost six years, five, five years, 11 months at PTC, then yeah. joined the rest of the crew at Blade Logic a year and a bit prior to the, the acquisition. Um, yeah. So was that just a knock at the door from a lot of the team that were at PTC to say, hey, Keith, come and, come and join us at Blade? Can you remember much about that day? Yeah, I do. Um, it was actually Andy Byron uh, <laughs> who, uh, who came knocking. Um, but I was ready. I mean, I, I, those, you know, Xerox and PTC both were pretty big companies by the time I, by the time I, I'd left. And, um, I was finding like, you know, the conversations I wanted to have, the impact I wanted to have weren't really going anywhere. And, um, and I wanted to have an impact and it was just kind of, as I was thinking about those things, you know, John and, and Andy, um, 
started started calling and, and seeing if I wanted to come over and, and join what they were doing over there. And uh, it was it was great timing. I really, frankly, didn't have good criteria. I just figured those guys were those guys knew what they were doing and they were pretty sharp. So uh, following them wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be the worst thing I could do. Sure. And so, did you join as an individual contributor, or did you go straight into management at Blade? Well, we were opening up Canada, so it was right. uh, it was it was it was an individual contributor role, uh, which was a little bit of ang- a little bit of an anxiety. But you know, you do. Uh, I just knew. I don't know. I guess I knew in my gut that to take that step back was the right thing uh, was the right thing to do for me. That there was so much I could I could learn, and it would pay me back later. And uh, man, I'm glad I did. That was an amazing experience at Blade Logic. Yeah. And how quick was the success there? Did you, was it instant? No, 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 I didn't. It wasn't instant. Um, I had to learn. I had to learn, like, I didn't know the space. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't, um, you know, I remember, uh, I remember going down to, um, to my first QBR. I walk into the room and we sit there and John's doing his thing and he's walking around and asking everyone to call out their core differentiation and do the messaging and stuff like that. And it was the first like real transparent meeting I'd really ever been in where, you know, you felt stripped naked really. Right. And um, I loved it on one side and the other side I was, I was frankly terrified. But um, I think in that, then that kind of conflict between those two things, I remember thinking, and these people are the best salespeople I've ever, I've ever been around. And I'm like really excited to, to learn. So I, I had some stuff I need, I needed to learn. And um and so it took me a bit, uh, but, um, but it was, it, it came when it came, it came big and um, it was transformative for me. Did you find, obviously you stayed on at PTC and went straight to Blade. A lot of yeah. the guys went off and did lots of other things and it was kind of getting the band together, uh, getting the band back together. Did you see, could you see the evolution? Did, did it really feel very different from, you know, Blade to PTC? Because obviously it was the next iteration of the playbook. Lots of new ideas that have been kind of changed. You know, what, what was your experience of that? Yeah, well, you know, I loved being at Blade Logic, And um, so going into BMC felt like I was going back to a, to a big company immediately. So I wasn't, I wasn't crazy about it at the beginning. And the culture difference was so strong. I mean we were kind of, you know, we were, I don't know, like sharp shooters or we were, you know, like, you know, we're really motivated guys who and gals who really just loved what we did and, and, and had a lot of urgency and, and so on. And, and the big companies are a bit different. So we went in there and it was the culture shock was the first thing. I mean, we flew down to, uh, I can't remember where it was. It was like, a, uh, it wasn't Reno, but um, uh, I can't remember where it was. Um, and it was a big, a big meeting, a big BMC meeting. And, uh, I remember everyone there was, was kind of in a state of shock trying to figure out how we're going to fit into this, into this big, uh, into this big company. Yeah. So uh, I, I suppose in terms of, you know, going, going back to kind of blade logic just before the, um, you know, the acquisition of BMC, I suppose a big part of your, your evolution or a big part of your playbook Keith is seek out teachers or find teachers. What was that a place where you found teachers in both blade logic and PTC? Um, Yeah, for sure. I'd say, um, yeah, it it was always something that, that I think, you know, my parents thought my parents were teachers, literally my whole family are, are a bunch of teachers. Um, and so uh, me doing business was, was, uh, was, was completely different for, for, for the family. But I, I think I just, I knew, um, I knew if I was going to be successful in business, I had, I had some stuff to learn. And uh, I always, you know, I've always had great coaching and um, well, not always, but I had experience to have great coaching in sports. I played, I played a lot of, a lot of um, high level rugby. Um, and I knew the difference it could make. Um, when you have a great teacher and when you don't, you know, I, my kids, they, when they have a great teacher, it, they love the subject when they have the exact same subject, they have a teacher that's not that great. They, they, they tend to, to get disengaged with, with the subject. So I, I just, I knew, uh, I, I guess that's one thing I did know that, that I needed that. And, um, you know, 
uh, there was great, uh, great stuff going on at PTC. I mean, they're on the forefront of kind of figuring out, frankly, how to sell enterprise software in my mind. And, um, and I knew it, I could, you could just feel the energy there. They spent so much time in development of people and, and working on process and, and, and so on was great. And at Blade Logic, I mean, John, you know, John was, um, was the master of this. Um, he could teach you, held you accountable, um, and, and, and have you generate great results kind of all at the same time. Um, and, uh, and so that was, that was obvious, you know, the more you can get of that, the better. And, uh, and that was kind of the decision I made. And how did that kind of start to craft the type of leader that you wanted to become? Uh, yeah, a big, I mean, um, a couple things there, I guess is, um, like Xerox and PTC, even Blade Logic to a certain degree were pretty harsh environments. And I always felt like there's so much goodness in the, in the teaching that they're, that they're teaching there. Uh, the, one of the big challenges is that, that reps, they, they have a lot of trouble figuring that out. And the question I always had was, you know, is it, um, is it, is it because they're just innately not able to do it or is there, or can you, can you help them with teaching? Can you really show them why they do something? And when you teach people why, uh, they tend to react better. So I started to kind of think about that a little bit as to like, okay, at a foundation, if I always, if I always explain why we're doing stuff, uh, it, helps, it helps people kind of understand why they, why they need to do it and, and helps you adopt, uh, helps you adopt a, a, a really you know, a good culture. So um, it's, always been, it's always kind of been core. And frankly, the more I do it, the, more, the better results I get. And, uh, and so I just, I continue to double down in that area. So I suppose at Blade Logic, um, you know, John McMahon was in full force. Um, you know, Medic was obviously a kind of a really key part of the playbook. But Keith, I know you've obviously got some very, very strong um, kind of thoughts about you know, how medic should and shouldn't be used. So it'd be really good for you to kind of give us a bit more of an insight of, you know, blade logic and then obviously how you um, kind of then evolved yeah. as part of your leadership style. Sure. Well, let's, we can start with medic. So yeah, it's a fairly popular and very misused um, term in my mind or, or acronym. Um, you know, First, of course, it's a, it's a qualification methodology, not a process. So um, what, that, what that means to me is, you know, um, it's, it's like a third person in the room who's not emotionally attached to your deal or to your career or to how you're feeling that day. It's basically just, a, it's a constant reminder of the things you need to do to put together a good deal. Um, and therefore, it's a great source. So um, I think of kind of like, there's, you know, salespeople specifically, you know, they get emotionally attached to these, to these sales campaigns. It's very hard to separate. So they make decisions, you know, that, that makes them feel good that are really the wrong decisions for the deal. Um, and so those decisions, um, they cascade. Like I really don't, you know, the, 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 the classic one is I really don't need to go see an executive before I do this, do this proof of concept because, you know, my champion really doesn't want me to, and I'm not really comfortable. So therefore I'll rationalize why I don't need to do that. Medic tells you, you need to do that. Otherwise your, your win percentage goes way down. Um, and so it reminds you, and um, you can kind of like start it as a checklist. But what I find with guys like, you know, with guys that, that, that I've worked with from the ground up, like, you know, like Rob Watson, for example, or Sam Costello, it rewires your, uh, it rewires the way you think about a deal and therefore you don't need the checklist as much anymore, but it, it kind of comes innately to you and your, and your gut starts to, to tingle when you, when you hear, when you hear things that, that, that kind of aren't medic, aren't medic related. So I don't know if that helps. It's, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a checklist. It's, it's a qualification methodology, but it also like really changes the way you look at, you look at deals. And when you do that, you're in a different plane. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned kind of Rob Watson, but he's kind of given a bit of a, a, an account into, you know, witnessing firsthand, you know, how how you're able to really control your champions and, 
you know, we've heard some incredible stories about, you know, how you manage that process. You know, it would be great for you to kind of just share a little bit more about, you know, some of your strengths in this particular domain. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, in, to me, all deals start with pain, pain and, and, uh, and someone who cares. Right. So, and pain, um, it's, it's layered. So, um, you know, the better you can get at like, breaking down and understanding pain um, the more you can connect what you're trying to sell to solving a problem um, one thing we believe is is you know solutions have no value unless unless they solve a problem so your tool is useless unless it solves a problem but why so why don't we connect the problem to the tool um, instead what we do is is leave that all to the customer and just talk about us all the time um, and so part of what we do is like work on the skills of identifying pain, breaking it down, connecting it to things um, and, and getting really good at it. And um, part of my playbook is getting really, really good at it all together. Technical guys, salespeople, everything. And, uh, and then we become problem solving machines. And it's, uh, it's like medic pure. We call it ice. I think guy, a guy who works with me, Brian Campbell, came up with, uh, at least introduced me to it. It's just the three acronym, three letters in medic ice. It's where it all starts. And we work on, we work on those things. Um, and I think, you know, it's like you do something early in the process. It saves you a lot of time later on. That's to me, the, uh, that's the secret sauce. Well, it's just going to say, it's absolutely incredible. As I said, that the more we hear about medic, as I said, the more and more and more, you know, as I said, layers are peeling back and, you know, the true benefits are just so obvious. Um, and it's just, it's crazy that not everybody's using it. And I think everybody kind of tries to use it. And, and as you said, there's a, you know, people executing it quite poorly. Um, yeah, so, I think one thing there, hmm. you got I think that one of the things is like, yeah, you can, you can learn a methodology, but the, it's, it's in the details, right? Mm -hmm. It's having the discipline and the desire, you know, to get into the detail and to actually really figure it out and do the, do the work that, that, that exists down there in the bowels of the details. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a characteristic that, uh, that we recruit for uh, is, is that ability, you know, mm -hmm. to do that. And that's, that's really what makes it come alive. Having it on a, on a PowerPoint slide stuck to your, your cubicle, uh, I don't know if that does you any good. No, definitely not. And I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so Blade Logic 2007 to 2012, um, yep. then on to RSA Avexa. And, and was it Vic, Vic, Vikram, was it? The... Vic Navi. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Yep. Vic and, uh, and Andy went to, to, build the, to build the sales organization. And I, um, I went there really to learn, like I, at that point I knew I wanted to, to try to be a CRO. Um, I felt like I just got so much energy from that part of the business and, um, and learning, learning more stuff every day there. So I, uh, I went to Andy basically to, to learn from him and from Vic how to do that. And, uh, and we had, we had for my, we had a great, a great quick run and I learned a ton in that time. It was, it was really, it was really good. And Avex was the we you joined Avex of the pre RSA acquisition, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a couple of years before, and um, we 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 sold that uh, sold that company to, to RSA. Right. And did yeah. you hang around long at RSA, or was Perfecto quite? I didn't, man. I was on a mission by then. I knew what I wanted to do, and I didn't want to waste any time. So I stay. I I stayed a little bit, but not too much. Maybe it was six months, right? Uh, just to get my feet underneath me and to figure out what I was going to go do, and then. Um, and I started, uh, started lifting my head up and, uh, Iran Yaniv from, um, from Perfecto, uh, got, uh, got connected to him. He's the CEO there and, uh, they were small and looking to do what, what I wanted to do. So I, I, I jumped on that. Brilliant. And that was your first, is that the first CRO position was, uh, sorry, was, was it brilliant. Yeah, it was my first CRO job. Yep. And that's when you say you had an eye on the prize, that's, that's where you saw yourself going and that's what you were, you're aspiring for that CRO and taking that full revenue and, and board level position. Yeah. I felt, I felt like I was ready to learn how to do that and uh, I really wanted it. So, um, 
so yeah, we, uh, we packed up the family and moved them down to Boston and, uh, and, and started, uh, started a five year run at, uh, Perfecto. It's up to, it's interesting that you said Keith a couple of times you've, you've actually mentioned it and I, I just want to grab hold of it. Yeah, sure. You kind of said that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, you, you knew what you were going after. How did you know? I don't think you know everything about it. You just know, you just know some of the core things about it. Like I realized that, you know, when I led people, I could make, I could make sales teams um, do things they couldn't do before. I, I didn't really know why. I just knew that, that that's something I, I, I was good at and I, and I got a lot of energy from it. So I knew I wanted to do that. Um, I know that like, I like to learn. And so um, I always looking for kind of take a bigger chunks of the, bigger chunks of the pie so that I can, uh, so I can learn. And uh, as you guys know, you know, leading and selling are two totally different things. I mean, it's, it's, I guess the analogy is a player and a coach are two totally different jobs. Um, And so, you know, the, the higher or the, or the, the bigger the job, the more the responsibility, the, uh, the, the, the more challenging the job uh, becomes in certain ways, at least from a learning curve perspective. So those are the things I, I knew um, that, that I wanted to do. And I, you know, I always wanted a seat at, I always wanted a seat at the table. Um, I think that's just, you know, I want to be, I always wanted to be something, uh, make something in my career. And I kind of just decided that's what I, that's how I was going to do it. So I knew those things, but I don't, I didn't know, I didn't know where or how or, or so on. You just kind of got to, I think you got to let that stuff go and just, just stay true to those core things and go for it. Yeah. I suppose, um, you know, it'd be good to understand how do you, how did you raise those standards? How did you get your sales reps to do things they couldn't do before? Uh, well, I think, um, one of the, one of the core things I think, you know, it's like a John Wooden thing from, from UCLA is like, um, no one knows their true capacity, but the leader sees things that, that, um, that they can't. Right. And so, um, by helping them figure that out, number one, that there's actually much more they can do. You, you start to, you start to get, uh, you start to get there. Um, and then, um, you, 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 you teach them things that, that, that work and, uh, and you start to, you start to build, uh, you start to build trust. And, uh, and then once you, once, once you got that, then you're, you're kind of off to the races. As long as you have a playbook, right? I think this is one of your key things. As long as, as, long as you have a playbook that really works, um, you got a really strong backbone to, to, to kind of to pull people in. And I mean, that was, that was, that's the genius of this thing is the, the playbook works if you do it. It doesn't work if you look at it. And, um, and, it's, hard, and it's hard to do. So you kind of got to have in my mind, like you got to figure out what, what, what people want and then you got to show them a path to get there. And then you just basically plug them in and help them and, uh, and keep them accountable to it. And, uh, and amazing things uh, continue to happen for those folks, which is really exciting and fun to watch. And in terms of the standards, uh, Keith, did, you know, did, did you hold people to very high standards? How, how did you kind of maintain that? I think, you know, I've given that some thought because, you know, um, I don't like the idea of being micromanaged. I think one thing that, you know, people like is autonomy in a way, like to kind of like use their brain to figure out how to do something. I think that's really motivating to people. At the other side, like there's things I know work. So um, why not just do those and forget about all that thinking and just, 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 just do this. And, you know, early on in my leadership career, I, I did more of that than I do today. And I think um, where I kind of came to is it's up to everybody. But my thing is um, I just uh, I, I set a standard, no question. And then um, and then we kind of like work together to try to figure out how to get there and then give them a little autonomy. But you got to keep the goal at the forefront all the time. And you got to be OK with like having conversations when people aren't. Aren't, aren't meeting those, Martin meeting those standards. So everybody knows. And, um, and as long as they're on, a, on, on a journey that you kind of both are into, then, uh, I think, I think you're good. 
So in terms, we hear a lot about enablement, you know, training is obviously a big part of everybody's playbook. It's just, you know, impossible. But just, just tell us about how you broke things down and made your team be able to absorb some of the teachings in, in the best possible way. Yeah. Um, well, Carlos Del Torre uh, was amazing at this. He taught me a lot of this stuff about onboarding and, um, and teaching and, and that kind of thing. I think um, so he gave me some really good fundamentals there. Um, I, I think, um, you know, getting people up to speed really quickly is, is, is really important. Yeah. It helps your productivity model and, and it helps you, helps you um, all that, all the, all of the, those ways, but it also helps the reps get confidence and, uh, and, and to feel good about what they're doing. They, they make a big decision to come and work in, in your organization and, you know, they got to get success and they got to get it quick. So development is, is the key lever there. Um, teaching them, you know, before they make, go make their mistakes and come back six months later, you, you get them on the, on the right path. Um, that's the first thing. I also think like in every interaction in every single meeting, one thing that really helps is when, when people leave learning something. So if you, uh, no matter what it is, a forecast call, Andy Byron was amazing at running really tough forecast calls, but you learn something every single time. And so it was development, but it was in the operating rhythm, for example. So I think development's like baked in. You got to bake it in. If you just having, you know, especially these days, Zoom calls on top of Zoom calls doing, doing PowerPoint, it's going to get old, but um, it's core. It's just, uh, you, you got to do it all the time. What do you mean by operating rhythm? Um, I think, well, operating rhythm, it's like the, the rhythm under which you lead by your weekly forecast calls, the, the uh, one-on-ones, the, we have what we call pipeline generation call, which is the call really focused on skills and results around generating pipeline. So the operating rhythm, it's predictable. It's, uh, it's how you operate. How do you find the right balance between predictable and you know slowing things down having having pace mm. uh well i mean like lean manufacturing or devops is all about like re- eliminating bottlenecks to go fast okay whatever the whatever the process is you're building a car or you're or you're building software sales process is a lot a lot the same um sometimes you need to slow down to go faster so what we've learned is like, if you, if you slow down on discovery and really understanding, connecting pain in those types of things, getting high and getting wide, covering as much medic as you can before you really engage in, you know, a POC, for example, um, you really go faster. Um, the, the thing is you got to really watch that stuff. So there's really good metrics you can extract from sales the process that kind of tell you if you're creating bottlenecks or if you're, or if you're actually relieving them. Uh, and, and so you really got to watch that stuff. Um, and I think also you got to teach people that that's what, that's what you're doing. And so they, when, once people buy into the metrics, then you're off to the races. Yeah. Do, do you invest, you know, do you invest all your time equally across your entire team or do you, do you, do you kind of, you know, how, how, where do you invest most of your time? Hmm. In the bottlenecks <laughs> <laughs> and relieving bottlenecks um, in the, in, in, in the process and people and their learning and their, in their development and in, in deals. So um, that's, I guess that's probably the most succinct way I could, I could say it. Um, you gotta, you gotta be careful not to chase problems. Um, oh, and you gotta be careful not to invest only in the people that are having success. So you kind of gotta, you gotta figure out for yourself, as a, as a leader and a manager of a business, like where is your, where is your effort? Um, where are you going to get the return? Um, we, you know, one thing that, that is, that is top of mind always is, is rep productivity, sales productivity. Uh, it is the, it is the number that, that allows us to, to do what we do. Uh, and so if you think of that and then you think of, okay, what are the things stopping me um, from, from improving that number? those bottlenecks kind of jump out at you. Yeah. What do you mean by chasing problems? Sorry, Keith. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, just, um, just 
chasing problems because they're problems. I mean, the bigger an organization get, they all have problems. Uh, the question is, which ones are you going to work on? Right. Um, and they're not all equal. So because they don't all impact sales productivity the same. Um, and so, you know, but you can get, you can get, you know, you can chase other people's problems. Someone sends you an email with a problem and you feel obliged to chase it, but it doesn't impact sales productivity. So should I spend time there? Um, so you got to be thoughtful about it. I think maybe that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, I, I suppose, um, you know, just kind of a little bit about kind of the mastery, you know, we've spoken a lot about kind of enablement and stuff and, you know, mastery of, of the craft. Just tell us what that means to you, Keith, because I know this is a really important part of your, of your play, but just, just kind of reinforce that for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, my experience with, with it um, early on was, you know, you have, you build this, you hear about champions and champions and champions and, all this medic related stuff. And then, and then you do it and you, and you see for yourself, the result, you build a champion that does amazing things, makes amazing change, gets promoted in their organization. And, and, you know, they call on you to help them solve problems uh, out of the blue. Um, you, you see the impact of, of doing that. And uh, it's really, uh, it's really, it's really inspiring. Um, and so that comes with the mastery of, of the craft, the better you get, the easier it is to do that. Um, the more you do it, the bigger deals you do, um, the more big deals you do, then you start to lead and teach people how to do that and so on and so forth. And, and each step, the better you get at, um, at each of the things that, you know, make up the craft, they all have, they all have a turn. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's, that's the beauty. And the other thing is when you watch other people do it, when you, when you, when you get to watch them, um, these people you're talking to, um, have basically gone on their own journey to do that. And, and they've, and they figured it out. Uh, and that's, that's like, what else is there? That's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. It, it is amazing because we are now seeing the effects of those standards that you have imposed on, on, on others. And, you know, we are seeing the next wave of sales leaders and future CROs who are your disciples. And, you know, many of the 33 CXOs, obviously this series is about the 33 CXOs. And we talk about John McMahon and we talk about, you know, the success of, of, of you guys and the amazing careers that you're having. But what you're talking about now is the investment, which is now spooling the next generation which i think is just uh it's, it's, it's profound mm. the full extent of the impact that you guys are having do, keith do you think this the playbook is going to evolve anymore do you think that there's room for it to evolve and you know adapt do you think technology is going to change enough for it to need to adapt or yeah well like anything you know fundamentals tend to stay pretty constant and, and kind of how you execute against those things change a lot. So, um, you know, back in the day, you know, we didn't, you know, the, the, the flywheel or the, the, the um, SDR function and, and, and the um, inside sales and, and all those kind of like, you know, mid-market things were things I didn't spend any time thinking about. And, and you know, it's frankly, it's not really covered in, 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 uh, in medic. It's, it's, it's in, 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 I spend most of my time in enterprise selling, but the world's changed. Uh, and frankly, the people we lead have changed too. And so, you know, yeah, it's got to change. It's changing right now with, you know, with COVID and so on. Um, you know, the ability to kind of do what we do on site, which has a lot to do with, you know, how we learned how to do this stuff is, is totally different. Mm. And so you got to learn different ways to do it. Uh, but the fundamentals are still the same you know, people want to accomplish stuff and they need leadership and they need, they need programs. The playbook um, will change, but the, the, the medic will stay the same. And, uh, and I think, I think that's how it's going to go. Yeah. Cause obviously building a champion is obviously the, a real big part right. of this. Right. And yeah. you know, the situation that we're in where you've got those interpersonal parts, you know, which come from being face to face with somebody sitting down you know, talking to them, 
that element missing, do you think that has, has created an impact and had a negative effect in, 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 in the environment that we're operating in with Zoom and stuff like that? I think what we're finding is, um, so people still need to solve problems in their companies. Mm. Um, business needs to, to go on and, and um, that's not changing. So champions need to be built. How you do it is, is changing rapidly. So like I said, instead of going on site for three hours and getting on a whiteboard and going through it, you know, a lot of the great salespeople are, are kind of starting to break that down, for example, into components, doing 30 minute sessions and doing kind of like surveys online where they can collect data instead of having to be in a whiteboard and, and kind of documenting a lot more than we needed to document things before. So um, changing the interaction, but the fundamentals, it's still, you need, you know, People solve problems and therefore there's champions waiting to be found out there. Yeah. Cause we heard, who was it Simon that told us in regards to, it was Paul Kant and the PTC, you know, the, the, the playbook came really was born from an idea, which was um, a survey that went out to a hundred CIOs, thousand CIOs. thousand CIOs asking if I've got an hour with a sales rep, what do you want to hear? And on the back of that, feedback is where everything then got reversed engineered. Is that correct, Simon? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it could well become a point now of another survey coming out to see now that we can't spend all this time together and, you know, we're having to interact in different ways. Is there anything else you want to hear from us? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, um, so yeah. So obviously, um, you know, five, you know, it's very successful year, CRO, your first CRO role, you know, big impact at Perfecto. Um, um, obviously, kind of a short stint at Vera and then observing, which is where you are now, which is, I mean, it's just an incredible, incredible place to be in this moment. You mentioned you wanted to get into something a bit earlier. You spoke about Mike Spizer very briefly there, but how important is are the founders and the VCs and the kind of strategy and, you know, t piece this whole story together for us, Keith. Yeah, I'm sure. I'll, um, for me anyway, the, um, well, after Perfecto, I've really spent a couple of years um, kind of dabbling around in, in, in some smaller stuff and, and um, trying to, trying to figure out what I think is kind of the next chapter in, in my, in, in my, in my career. Uh, which was which was kind of trying to figure out how small companies become really big, um, and uh, and how does that start right from the from the very beginning? Um, you know, you guys are doing a lot of work on uh, on John McMahon's kind of sales playbook, and I think there's another half of the equation is what I'm finding is is you know not just the product but like how that how those puzzle pieces come together, um, and you know Sutter Hill Ventures in my mind is is the best at that. I mean, they, 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 I think they have a formula that, that gives you an amazing opportunity uh, to build a really big company. And um, I, you know, I, 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 I've kind of been really interested in that. And when uh, observe opportunity came, I knew that was the place that, uh, that I could go and I could go and test all these things out that, that I do and, and execute a, and execute a playbook here. Why, what do they do well and who does it well? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not an expert uh, in, in, in their model. I, you know, on my side of it, I, I am. But, you know, essentially find a, a big market with, with, uh, that's going through some change and uh, have the foresight to, to know that, number one, which is, which is amazing. And then secondly, to find a technical problem uh, in, that, in that space that's really, really hard technically to, to solve. Um, and first, if you solve that, um, then, you know, you have a one pillar of the foundation and then really what you need is, is great sales. Um, and not just to sell. And this is the part that I, that I, that I, I'm really, uh, I'm really enjoying. And, um, and I, and I, and I've come to love is, is the providing the vehicle to get feedback to the product, to build an amazing, amazing product, to find the product market fit salespeople, um, are really good listeners and not just to the, to the words, but to the things that happen in between the words, if that makes any sense. Um, they have an intuition. And so um, it makes for amazing feedback. And that's frankly what I think, you know, Mike Spicer 
uh, and Sutter Hill uh, have figured out. Uh, and that's where, you know, that's, you know, Chris Degnan and, and, and Snowflake, that was kind of, he, he pioneered that, um, that role for, for guys like me at, uh, at Snowflake. So I'm really uh, interested in, in, in figuring that thing out. Uh, and then Jeremy Burton here, who's got tons of experience, our CEO, um, is, uh, has been around this world and, and brings just a ton of, a ton of a leadership, which again, uh, I saw, I, I, I tend to, uh, tend to look for. So that's, that's, that's the equation. Yeah. Great. And what's the mission? Um, well, we're going to build, uh, we're, we're going to build a big company. Um, and, uh, in the short term, we're, uh, we're going to make sure that, you know, we, 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 when we, when we have a J product that it's, uh, that it's ready for, uh, it's ready for prime time and that uh, it solves real problems for, for, for customers. So right now that's really what we're doing. We had a launch, a company launch, um, a couple of weeks ago and, uh, we just got tons of momentum. The problem we found is, is, is big, uh, and it's real. And now we're just trying to put the pieces together to, uh, to make sure we can make our customers really successful with it. Mm. And um, what, what about your mission within the mission? You know, if, have you oh. set yourself kind of personal goals and aspirations of what you want to achieve? Well, I mean, first of all, I love doing this. Like I love, you know, I love building and, and, and especially sales teams. Um, and so that's kind of, that's good. And that's, that's greatness. I want, you know, I'm learning more about all the other go-to-market functions here. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's a lot of fun. So, you know, what do I want? I guess I just, I want to build a big company so that, you know, we can, uh, we can have great customers and success. We can, they can help a lot of people be successful and we can, we can go win together. I guess that's what it's about. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. You say that because obviously I suppose one of your, one of your mantras is do something you love, right. Uh, you know, and, and be passionate about it, you know, t tell us a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, well, on one level, like, you know, sales doesn't seem to be something that, that, that you, that you'd love, at least when I was, you know, in college or whatever, I didn't think I was going to be, be love, love sales. And, um, you know, when I talk to my kids about it, they're like, you know, they, they kind of get their eyebrows go squirrely, like, really? Um, that's what you, that's what you put all your, <laughs> that's where you are all the time. Mm -hmm. That's where you spend your, all your life. Um, but, um, but you got to find, you know, what I did really quickly was find things in there that I really loved, like, like, uh, leadership and, uh, and winning and, um, and watching people, watch people grow, that kind of stuff I do love. And there's no better place, um, than selling to, uh, to do that in my mind. Um, and so that's, that's what I love, but you got to do that. I mean, if, if you don't like it, we put so much energy into this. I mean, it's, 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 it becomes a, it becomes an all consuming thing. And, uh, if you don't love it, it's, it's real painful. I mean, I can't imagine doing it if you don't love it. So I think that's, that's important. So what does Keith do outside work then? What is, what, you know, as I said, you, you, you talk about being completely consumed in this, but you know, what, what do you do outside of work and what sacrifices have you made to, to get to where you've got to? Yeah. Well, um, number one, like, you know, dragon, we just, we just moved out West, um, to, to the Bay area because that's where, uh, that's where observe is. And, and before all this started, that was the plan. Um, for all the our COVID started, that was the plan to kind of get, get in the office and all that. So they've moved all over the place, uh, with my career. And I got two teenage boys and, uh, and a wife who, uh, who have paid the price of, of that, which, uh, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for. Her. Um, but I, you know, I, I had to learn, you know, I've had to learn, um, how to, how to take time. I always work out. Um, I did triathlons after I started stopped playing rugby and I kind of still do that as, as an old guy, just, uh, just banging around in my free time doing that. I try take an hour every day and work out. Um, I read a lot and, um, I try to, I try to, try to stay involved. And, um, and so, you know, and I, and I, I, I really try to, to, to take time for the family. Uh, and, uh, that's something I've had to learn. Uh, my boys are getting, getting older and, um, and you really realize. So, uh, it's important. It's, it's you know, the last question we normally ask Keith is 
quite an interesting one given what you've just spoken about you know product fit but we always ask the question does the hunter make the unicorn uh yeah. in the sense does the sales is it possible for the, those you know billion dollar businesses to exist without the sales engine what are your views on that mm. well i'm um i can speak from my experience i think i think both right i think you need to be an amazing company you need an amazing product and you need amazing sales and uh, you need amazing sales. Um, you can do it one, one way or the other. Um, there's examples, but um, I think that's not, that's not, that's not the way, that's not the way to, to do it. I think you, um, I think, I think you need, I think you need both. I mean, guys like, I don't know, I, I won't, I won't dig into details, but I think, you know, yeah, both is my answer. I'd say. Okay. Great. Well, Keith, I, I suppose as a, as a bit of a kind of a summary uh, of what we've heard today, it, it's evident that you're, you're obviously of the competitive mold, the kind of ice criteria, which is well documented, but kind of the early days you were, you know, in, a, in an environment that you thrived because you, were, you enjoyed that kind of winning, that winning mentality. Um, but there were still gaps and you were seeing that other people were having effect that perhaps when you were reflecting on yourself, though there were gaps and it wasn't until you mastered those gaps that, as you said, the lights came on and when the lights came on, that's what gave the oxygen for you to not only develop as a, as a sales person, but as a sales leader. And in your pursuit as of wanting to find the answers um, and your nature and being quite a kind of a, a, more of a teacher and wanting to teach leadership and pass that on to others, we can see the evolution which has really enabled you to kind of get to the level that you have. And we also understand why there's a lot of people that are successful but aren't able to make that leap because they're not able to break things down and really get to the bottom of understanding the detail between the detail, getting to the, to the bit behind, as you put it, the, power, the PowerPoint presentation that you stick up on the wall and really understanding what's actually happening, why it means and piecing it all together. And I think in, in that mastery, you've now perfected the art of being able to raise the standards of those around you, demanding excellence. We, we, we've heard about, you know, from others, how you, you, you don't impose those standards. Those are standards that are expected. And, and that's how you're creating these amazing kind of winning teams. And it's no surprise that you find yourself now at the cusp of something that can truly, truly be, you know, a, a, a real game changer. And, you know, I just really wanted to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been a, a really, truly fascinating and, and very insightful um, episode today. And we've really enjoyed having you on the show. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I, I appreciate the invite. I was, uh, I'm just a guy on a journey. So I was surprised that, uh, frankly, you wanted to, uh, wanted to talk to me. There's guys in this network that have done amazing, amazing things. Um, and so uh, I was humbled. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you so much for your time, Keith. Really, really do appreciate it. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I know this is going to hit a lot of chords um, with a lot of people listening. So um, thanks ever so much. Really do appreciate it, Keith. Hey, Simon Ollie. Thanks, guys. See you. Thanks.